Good morning. And a special welcome to family and friends of Stuart and Haley. Uh, lovely to have you all with us on this special occasion of James' baptism. I remind folks, every baptism, I've not had a child cry on me yet since I came to Edsel. Are you listening, James? Thumbs up. It's going to be great. A um, couple of items to draw your attention to. Uh, first of all, big thanks to everyone, uh, the Guild especially, but all who helped out and attended the Daffodil Tea yesterday. The grand sum of £395.80 uh, was raised. So thank you to everyone involved in that. Tuesday marks the first outing this year of the Church History Group. So we're going to gather, we're going to return to Brechin Cathedral. We're going to, uh, they're very kindly agreed to bring a number of items out uh, from the archives for us to look at. So 11.30 we'll meet at the cathedral and we shall look at a number of uh, documents, church history documents, and then we shall look at the interior of the building. The last time we were there, we never really got a chance to do that. The tower, we had an opportunity to visit, go up the tower, and that was it. Everybody was up the tower and just taken with the views and so on. So we're going to have an opportunity to look at the artifacts and the interior architecture and so on. Then we'll break for lunch. Then we'll return to the cathedral. We're going to have some worship, um, communion and in the chancel area, and also a, sh a very short address about the difference between what we'll contrast and compare uh, pre- and post-Reformation worship. So that's what, that's what we're hoping to do. Not everyone will be here, but just for a rough idea, we were chatting about it yesterday, and if you intend going, could I ask you to raise your hands? It's just to give us a rough idea of how many to, to expect kind of thing. Okay, and I suspect there'll be a few more folks from, from Brecon, and, and, uh, and Ross has got his two hands up, so we'll count them twice. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's super. Uh, Wednesday evening, we continue our Bible study in the church lounge. All welcome. We're in Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 1, and we shall look at verses 8 through 17. 8 to 17 in chapter 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans on Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the hall next Sunday, usual time and place. Before we worship, we have a special song to sing because I believe that there's a special birthday. Someone is having a special birthday. And so, where is Doris? She's hiding somewhere. She's, she's away up there somewhere. I see her. So I'll no mention age. No, it's just syndrome. Special birthday, so we, I think it's only right and proper that we sing happy birthday to Doris. We'll begin our worship. Our first hymn this morning is a well-known hymn, Christ is Our Light. It's number 336 if you're using the church hymnal, but the words will appear on the screen.
let us come before God in prayer. Let us bow our heads. Our great and gracious God, let your light shine upon us and be in us, that we in turn may let our light shine before you and others, who may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. We gather in the name of your only begotten Son to worship you in spirit and in truth, who alone is worthy of all glory, honor, and power. We thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness towards us. We thank you for your glorious gospel of which we are unashamed to stake our living hope. Bless us and be gracious to us. Receive our sacrifice of praise and prayer and speak to us by the word of sacred scripture and in the visible word of the sacrament of baptism this morning. Also receive our free will offerings. Take them and use us for the maintenance and advancement of your church and kingdom of love here, near, and far. We ask your blessing upon the family and friends of Stuart and Haley Zimmerman, who today present their son James to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Impress upon them and all of us here present the significance of the sacrament and all that is signed and sealed to us therein and grant them grace to raise James and his brothers, Harry and Lewis, in the nurture, discipline, and instruction of the Lord, as promised. Help us rejoice in the light, love, and life that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, forgive us our sins and wash and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, for Jesus' sake. For by the water and the blood we are made right with God and called to walk in newness of life as your beloved children. Help us be the people you have called us to be. Beautify our lives with your grace and glory. Help us hold fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Bless our families and our friends whom we commit and commend to your care and keeping and all who are associated with us. Bless our neighbours and all who work in our community for our mutual good. We remember especially those that work throughout our nation to protect us, to heal us, to care for the vulnerable. Be with the children, the teachers and staff as the schools return from the Easter holidays. Lord, we pray for peace and prosperity for all in our nation and throughout the world. Comfort the bereaved, heal the sick, Strengthen the weak, grant stamina to the weary, seek the lost, provide for the poor, grant wisdom to those with responsibility for others, send laborers into your harvest field in Jesus' name, who taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm going to read the words of institution. These are the words that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us when he instituted the sacrament of baptism. And I'm reading in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. I'm going to read from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm going to invite the congregation, as we do at baptisms. At the Lord's Supper, we, as a congregation, we say together, the words of the Nicene Creed, reaffirming our common faith 
And at baptism, we turn to the Apostles' Creed. And so we, again, affirm our common faith in the words of the Creed. So I'd ask everyone just to be upstanding, and we shall say the Creed uh, together. I can't even read that. I'm going to use the book. <laughs> I had a letter from Specsavers recently reminding me that I'm long overdue vis a visit. So, 628. Six, Here we are. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll invite the congregation to please be seated with the exception of the baptismal party. <laughs> When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, the Spirit of God came upon him. His baptism was completed by his dying and rising again. Our baptism is a sign of dying to sin and rising to new life in Christ Jesus. It is Christ himself who baptizes us, but the Spirit of Pentecost, he makes us members of his body the church, and calls us to share his ministry in the world. By water and the Holy Spirit, God claims us as his own. He washes us from sin and sets us free from the power of death. In the sacrament, the love of God is offered to each one of us. Though we cannot fully comprehend it or explain it, we are called to accept that love with the openness and trust of a little child. In baptism, James is assured of the love that God has for him, and the sign and seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon him. Let us bow our heads. Lord our God, we thank you for the sacrament of baptism, for all that is signed and sealed to us therein. We ask your rich blessing be upon James and his parents, Stuart and Haley, and his brothers, Harry and Lewis. We pray for their family and friends gathered with us for this special occasion. And we pray that we might all have occasion to reflect upon the significance of our own baptism. May your grace and glory rest upon James and all of us now and forevermore. Amen. For James, Jesus Christ came into the world. He lived and displayed God's love. He suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, it is finished. For James, he triumphed over death and rose to newness of life. He ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for James, although he does not yet know it. And so the scripture is fulfilled. We love because he first loved us.
Please be seated. James belongs to God in Christ, and from this day he will be at home in the church. There will always be a place for him. Tell him of his baptism and unfold to him the treasures that have been given to him today so that he may come to know that he has been baptized and as he grows make his own response in faith and love that he may in due time come to enjoy the full communion of life in Christ Jesus and his body the church. Let us nurture one another in faith. Let us uphold one another in prayer. Let us encourage one another in worship. I'm going to invite our session clerk to make a short presentation. Thank you. We're going to sing uh, once again. It's a baptismal hymn. It's number 632 if you're using the church hymnal. Our children, Lord, in faith and prayer. say we are delighted to, to have young folks in the kirk but if you feel that either mum I need the loo or alternatively you just feel that you want to step out the hall the toilets and the hall are next door and so you won't disturb anyone but if you need to you can either go that way or through that door there so just to let folks know and, and set your minds at ease. Brenda's going to read the New Testament scriptures to us.
I'm not going to the toilet or the hall. <laughs> Looking out in the christening party makes me and possibly them think we're back at school. <laughs> Today's reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, reading from verse 1 to verse 6, 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing love with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And thanks be to God for the reading of his word. I remember James, great-grandfather, once telling me that his favourite song was Wild Mountain Time. And I had a wee look and I discovered a hymn. And it's actually the Magnificat, the words of the Mary's song, that's been somebody's put to the tune Wild Mountain Time. So that's what we're going to sing now. Uh, my soul is filled with joy. It's not to be found in our hymnal, but the words will appear on the screen.
Please be seated. Well, we turn back to the portion of Scripture that Brenda read to us a few moments ago. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, and I wish to read again so that we might reflect for a very short period on verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Excuse me. <coughs> this Sunday, and following on from the sacrament of baptism, I want to reflect briefly on the theme of growing to Christian maturity. I say that because baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant or the promise of God's grace to us. It is a sign and seal of our incorporation into the Lord Jesus Christ and into his body, the church. And that is why it is ordinarily administered at a regular service of worship like this one. You will recall the words of institution that we read earlier. We're to go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that Christ has commanded. And then comes the promise, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, as the apostle reminds us, the promise is for you. It's for our children too. Covenant children are part of the church, and that's why Paul, specifically in the following chapter, addresses them when he bids them obey your parents. However, we are all, in a sense, beloved children of God who are baptized and have come to believe on Christ Jesus. And we are therefore called to be growing in grace and in knowledge. We are called to be growing in faith, faithfulness and fruitfulness. We are called to Christian maturity. Consider, therefore, growing to Christian maturity begins in childhood for some, for covenant children. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We are to be built up in love. Christian parents have the sign and seal of the covenant administered to their children in baptism, just as Stuart and Haley had James baptized today. They make vows to, we make vows to raise our children <coughs> in the nurture and admonition or the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We promise to tell them about their baptism and the significance of baptism, to share with them and to live out with them the good news that we profess as Christians. We're to pass on our rich heritage and even more importantly, our glorious inheritance. Christian parents have the chief responsibility for communicating the glad tidings of great joy to their children. They are to make the joy of the Lord a living reality, not only when they gather with others in the context of church, but in their homes and elsewhere. They, we bring our children to church because they are members of the covenant community as beloved children of God. The church also has a responsibility to care for covenant children by nurturing and nourishing them in the faith through the ministry of word and sacrament and prayer. Growing to Christian maturity therefore necessitates communion, fellowship, a union in other words with God in Christ. We're to grow up in every way unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, 
makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What the Apostle's reminding us of here is, firstly, communion with God in Christ is revelational. In other words, we need the Word, the Word in Scripture, and the visible Word in the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper too. We need to know God's will for our lives in order to grow up in it, to grow to Christian maturity. Communion with God is relational, for we're not only called to be, but we're called to belong. We are, in other words, family. We are a fellowship of God's people that is rooted and built up in love. We are to care for one another. We are to support one another. We are to encourage one another. No person is an island, John Donne used to say. And how true. Communion with God in Christ is reformational. It is transformational. Because the goal is to grow in love. To walk by faith, to grow in Christ's likeness, to manifest the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ, which is love, because God is love. It is to put on Christ and to make him known near and far. Growing to Christian maturity necessitates conformity to Christ. Hence, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is, into Christ. And this re requires recognition on your part and my part of our Christian call to grow up in the way, the truth, and the life. It is a remarkable blessing to know these things and to be taught these things as young people. But from there we begin that journey, just like a tender plant how it grows up before it blossoms and blooms. So it is in the Christian life. And sometimes the Christian life starts at a much later age. Whatever age we've attained on life's highway, we are to grow. The Lord wants us to grow, and he transforms us for such. And hence we need to recognize our call. We're to let our light shine before others. As we walk in his light. We're to love as he loves us. So we are to love one another. This requires a sense of conviction and compulsion. That these are not just words that are spoken in a theoretical sense. But they apply to me and to you. We need to hear and heed them. And hence that we come to that point where the Apostle Paul could say. The love of Christ compels me. To so act, to so be, to so belong. A willingness to follow Christ. A willingness ultimately to take up our cross. A willingness to trust and obey the Lord in all circumstances and situations. Remember what Jesus says. He says, my sheep hear my voice. He says, and I know them, every single one of them. And they follow me. And so we keep our eyes firmly fixed on him in order to grow. Just as the plant requires the sun to photosynthesize and to produce the carbons necessary for growth, the, the food. So you and I grow in love and all God's graces as we keep our eye firmly look, looking to the author and finisher of our faith. And this requires, hence, the keeping of his commandments. And this is just one of them. Go baptize. But remember what he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And they're not onerous. They're given by one we know is love. And therefore our blessing that we might love the Lord and love one another. Jesus says, you know, he says, all people will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. 
And it starts in the family, and it starts in the church family. We're to be like a beacon, radiating light and love near and far. Growing to Christian maturity necessitates, hence, commitment to Christ's church, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We must make use of the means of grace in the context of church. He has given to his church the sacraments and the ministry of the word. And we are to apply them. We're to make use of them for our, for our mutual blessing that we might glorify God and enjoy him too. We must make use of the ministry of grace and the confines of church because he has given some, not all, to be pastors and teachers as well as apostles and prophets and evangelists and so on. But here's the thing, and what Paul is stressing upon us here is that everyone has gifts and graces, and we are to utilize, recognize, and utilize our gifts and graces for the blessing of the body, so that every part is invaluable for the health and harmony of the whole. And so we share in one another's gifts and graces for our mutual benefit, for love's sake. We must, moreover, make use of the message of grace. Not only when we gather as a company, as the people of God in the context of church, but in the family, and hence it starts there. We teach and support our children and one another. And in the community, we wear our faith on our sleeves. We're not ashamed to say that we trust in Christ Jesus because we've tasted and found that he is good that he is love. Growing to Christian maturity finally is the way to good character formation. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head and to Christ who makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You see, what we're being taught here is this is conducive to our blessing, to our, our collective good as well as our individual benefit. We learn to walk by faith and do those good works that are to be done in love in that context of family and fellowship. This is constructive to our mutual blessing, the building up of one another, of Christ's church and kingdom of love. In other words, it is edifying. It is engaging. It is equipping. We equip one another as God blesses us so we bless. Freely we receive, freely we give of our time, our talents, our treasures. It is encouraging, and we encourage one another thereby. We are to display, adorn, and beautify our lives with the fruits of the Spirit. This is our compliance with, to the words of Christ, to the person of Christ. And you see, it's for our mutual health. <laughs> for the health of the body. It works best when everyone recognizes their call. It's for harmony that we would walk in those paths of peace and pleasantness together. And it's for our happiness, for the joy of the Lord is truly our strength. May we all, therefore, seek to grow to Christian maturity. God is with us and God is for us and he will bless us. Well, may he himself add his blessing to these few thoughts to us this day. I'm going to hand over to the choir who are going to sing to us.
I'm not entirely sure who's on the intercessory prayer today. Who is it? Hmm? It looks like it's a minister. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we want to bless you and praise you for your goodness to us once again. We thank you for the myriad of ways in which you bestow grace upon us day by day. In particular, today we want to thank you for ministry of word and sacrament. And again, we ask your blessing upon James and upon his family and friends and indeed all our church family gathered in this place. We remember those who are too poorly, who are sick, who are unable to join with us here in church. And we pray that you would lay your healing hands upon them and restore them uh, to good health. We remember those who have lost loved ones and pray that you would uphold and strengthen them and comfort them, enable them to look back with joy in their hearts and to look up and find assurance that loved ones are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus, are reunited with those who have gone before. And one day there will be that glorious uh, reuniting, never to be parted again. We ask your blessing upon our community, upon those who, um, who have shops in the village, who look, of, look after here and elsewhere, who look after the needs of the community. We ask, O oh God, that you would prosper them in what have been difficult times. We pray, O oh Lord, once again, for not only peace in our nation, but peace in Europe. We are mindful of the continuing war in Ukraine, and we ask for an end to a uh, cessation to the hostilities there. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who have lost loved ones fighting um, in that war. And we pray, Lord, that heads might yet come together, that they, that they would be forced, compelled to reason and to turn away from violence and hatred. We ask, O oh Lord, that we, your people, would be able to walk in peace uh, before you and one another, and that we would pursue peace as the Prince of Peace commands us to do. We ask, O oh God, your blessing uh, upon those who are, who are poor in terms of material possessions. We pray that you would provide for their every need. We are mindful of those who are without homes. We are mindful of those who are citizens, now without a nation, refugees and others. And we pray that provision may be made for all your children. We ask your blessing upon the church throughout our nation and, particular, and throughout the world. We pray, Lord, that you would build her up and that you would make her strong and that more and more people would yet come to know the love of God which is for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Be with us and go before us. Keep us and enable us to grow to Christian maturity for Jesus' sake, for the glory of our God and for the good of us and one another. Hear then our prayers. Forgive us and renew us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude our time of worship by singing a well-known hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. It's praise number 465 in the church hymnal.
And now as we leave this place of worship, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with each one of you now and forevermore. Coffee will be served in the hall after the service. <laughs>